sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation. And I will adore you, filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. It's hard to be judged for one mistake, but it's what I'll be remembered for, I guess. I wasn't always the doubter. That's not who I am. I have a zeal for Jesus. I always have. When Lazarus died, no one wanted to return to Bethany with Jesus. The atmosphere there was volatile and dangerous. Jesus said he'd show us his glory. I assumed we'd all die there. Still, I'm the one who said, let's go. But then, then came this room. That night. At the time, None of us understood as we sat at that table. This is my body? 
This is my blood. He raised the dead. He, he cast out demons even. What could he possibly mean? I didn't doubt it when they told me he was dead. But how can you not doubt someone coming back to life? Some didn't doubt. But for me, it was harder. Maybe it was just that I didn't want to be disappointed. Many came after me who believed without seeing what I saw. Jesus called them blessed. Yes, I touched the place of the nails, the hole in his side. Such definitive proof that I cried out, my Lord, my God. But that wasn't the only amazing thing. The Almighty One, he came back for me. He didn't want to leave me behind in my doubt. He says, I'm worth that. And I'll follow him anywhere for the rest of my life. Thomas is first introduced in Scripture as an apostle of Jesus. Jesus went into a mountain and prayed all night to God about who he should choose to be the 12 men, the 12 apostles that would follow him most closely, who he would give his ordinance to, who he would teach very closely. After this prayer and guidance by the Holy Spirit, Jesus chose these 12 men. If you look here in Luke 6, 12 through 13, and it came to pass in those days that he went up into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and one of them, he, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he called apostles. Simon, who he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother. James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, and there we have it, Thomas, one of the twelve apostles in his first mention in Scripture. And then it says, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Thomas is popularly known as what? Oh, Doubting Thomas. He was, he was also named Didymus. And that means twin, so apparently he was the twin brother of somebody. But I think that Thomas gets a bad rap. I do not label him as Doubting Thomas. I do not think Scripture labels him as Doubting Thomas. And I do not believe you should label him as Doubting Thomas. And I'll tell you why this morning. Thomas was an apostle of Jesus, surely an outstanding man of character. And his attributes were absolutely most outstanding for Jesus after praying to God for Jesus to choose him to be one of just mere 12 people. We know that there was only two others in Scripture that were called apostles, and that was Matthias and Paul. Thomas was a very special man of faith. You know, Thomas surely accompanied Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. Thomas firsthand saw Jesus walk on water. He saw Peter walk on water with Jesus. He saw Jesus feed 5,000. He, he saw Jesus heal the blind. He saw Jesus cure the sick. He saw Jesus cast out demons. And the most incredible thing that he saw Jesus do was raise a man named Lazarus from the dead four days after he had died. And that is where we will pick up with Thomas in Scripture right there at the account of Lazarus being raised from the dead. There was a man named Bethany. His name was Lazarus. He had a couple sisters, Mary and Martha. Now Jesus loved Mary very much. He loved Martha very much. He loved Lazarus 
very much. But Lazarus had became sick, sick even to death. So Mary and Martha send to Jesus and say, Jesus, your friend Lazarus has died. He is sick and you need to come. Well, Jesus says, well, I think that uh, I'll wait two more days where I'm at. Then I'll come. Jesus knew something that nobody else did. Jesus knew that Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God. So after two days, he goes to his disciples and he instructs them that they are going to Judea. Then after that, he says to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Again. So he goes and says, okay guys, it's time. We're going unto Judea. But his disciples did not like that very much. They did not like the idea of going back. His his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? They're they're saying, listen, the last time you were there in Judea, you were tried to be stoned. They tried to kill you. Are you really sure that you want to go back there, Jesus? I don't think that's a good place for I to go. So then Jesus tells them why he needs to go to Judea. These things said he. And after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. So they say, Jesus, hold on, wait a minute. You're going to go to Judea where they want to kill you because you want to wake up Lazarus? He's sleeping. Leave him alone. Okay? He's just a sling. Why would you want to go wake a man up and risk your life for it? They didn't quite understand. But howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Guys, Lazarus is dead. The disciples didn't want to go. They didn't want to follow Jesus. They didn't want to go risk their lives. But up steps a man named Thomas. And let's see if this is doubting Thomas to you. Then then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas says, If Jesus is going, we're going too. Wherever Jesus goes, I will follow him, even unto death. Jesus goes, we're going. If Jesus dies, we're going to die too. We're going to follow him wherever he rebukes his fellow disciples and says, there's no doubt we're going to follow Jesus. Guys, Thomas loved the Lord even unto death. He wanted to follow Jesus wherever he would go. In fact, after the ascension of Jesus, much later in Thomas' life, he would actually start a church in India And Thomas died while on his knees in prayer being killed by Lance. He died as a martyr for Jesus Christ. Thomas was not doubting Thomas. So now I want to move slightly ahead to the last week of Jesus' ministry. A week before he would die on the cross. Jesus knew that it was nearing the end of his time. Jesus knew that his time was coming. So he took some last minute preparation, some last minute time to really have close relationship, have close talks with his disciples. So all of the disciples, including Thomas, they gather together at a Passover meal in the upper room. As they gather together at this meal, after they eat, Jesus does something remarkable. He stands up. He takes a towel, he wraps it around him, he goes and gets a basin full of water, he puts it down, and Jesus Christ, Savior, Master, gets on his knees and washes the disciples' feet. Can you imagine what Thomas would have thought as Jesus humbly grabs his foot and starts to wash it? Jesus was teaching them a last-minute lesson about humility. And surely, guys, this grew Thomas's love for his Lord and his Master. A Master that would humble himself to such a lowly task. What an example. So after he had washed the feet and he had taken his garments and was sat down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? 
you call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You you need to serve one another. So after the Passover meal, after the washing of the disciples' feet, then Jesus introduces the Lord's Supper. Judas, who has a much different task to accomplish. He's about to betray Jesus. Judas is dismissed. And then Jesus takes the unleavened bread. He breaks it and says, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He hands the bread to the disciples, including Thomas. Thomas eats. Well, then he takes the cup filled with fruit of the vine and he gives to each disciple that is present and says, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And the disciples and Thomas drink. Thomas eats the bread, drinks the fruit of the vine, listening to his master who had just washed his feet. And surely Thomas is trying to figure this all out. What's going on? What is he talking about? My body and my blood, the New Testament. Surely Thomas could sense the urgency of Jesus at this time. This was much different. Jesus knew his time was at hand. Jesus was surely very urgent. Jesus did not have much longer with them. Thomas loves Jesus. He doesn't want Jesus to go anywhere. He doesn't want Jesus to leave. He wants to go wherever Jesus is. How urgent is Jesus? He announces one's going to betray him. He says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And he says, I'm leaving soon. So the disciples, they're uneasy. They're anxious. They're scared to death. So what does Jesus tell them? John 14. That's where Thomas breaks on Scripture again. In John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled, he tells them. Don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Let not your heart... You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. He's talking about heaven. He's saying, don't worry. In heaven there's many mansions. And I'm going to prepare a place. That's where I'm going. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He says, don't worry, I'm coming back. I'm going to get you. I'm preparing a place for you. But then Thomas asked a question. Jesus says, and whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Thomas didn't quite have the spiritual understanding he needed. Jesus says, I'm going away. And Thomas, what? He says, well, I want to go with you. I want to go where you are. I want to follow you wherever. We see the heart of Thomas. He says, but I don't know where you're going. Give me an address. Thomas is thinking of a physical place. But Jesus is talking about heaven. No matter, Thomas wanted to be where Jesus was. So Jesus says, how do you get there? He says, I am the way to get there. I am the truth and I am the life. And that is a true statement this morning. If you want to get anywhere in the world on this earth, I can give you some address. I can give you some coordinates. You probably can get there. But the only way you are going to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life, and that's the only way to get to where Jesus is. is to get to where God is, is through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. And He tells Thomas this. So we see that the heart of Thomas, he's not doubting, he's wanting to go wherever Jesus is going. He can't stand the fact and the thought of being without Jesus. So after this conversation, we do not hear about Thomas until... 
after the resurrection of Christ. I'm going to land there in just one sec, but I want to give the timeline from this conversation to that resurrection. After this conversation, Jesus speaks to Thomas and the disciples, and he tells them various things, including about the Holy Spirit, their relationship with him, their relationship with others, their relationship with the world. Jesus, Thomas, and the other disciples make their way for, to the Mount of Olives. From there, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happens there? They go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas, the one who was dismissed earlier from the supper, right? What does he do? He comes to the Garden, and he kisses Jesus on the cheek, betraying him, identifying him, identifying him to the Jewish religious mob. They take him and they arrest him and they bring him to trial. And then Jesus, as we look, our first, we're having encounters with Jesus, right? That's our, whole, that's our whole theme. Our first encounter was who? This man right here, what was his name? Barabbas. Jesus is taken to trial. He has stood before the Jewish people. Jesus stands here. Barabbas stands there. And the crowd cries, crucify him him crucify him and they're talking about Jesus Barabbas is a murderer he's an insurrectionist he's a criminal he's a thief he's a liar but the crowd wants to crucify Jesus Christ the innocent lamb who's done nothing wrong so what happens Jesus takes the place of Barabbas Barabbas is freed and Jesus goes to the cross and dies what is that picture that pictures us we are Barabbas okay we are the sinners we are the murderers we're the insurrectionists we're the ones that deserve death but Jesus Christ what did he do he took our place he let us free he took our chains and he died on the cross for our sin amen, amen. hallelujah hallelujah <laughs> amen he took our place. So then he goes to the cross. He's brutally beaten. And he hangs there on the cross. He, he takes Jesus Christ. Takes upon our sin. Your sin. And my sin. And he pays the price for it. Jesus died. Said it is finished. And the price of sin was completely and totally paid. And Jesus Christ hangs lifeless on the cross. With your iniquity. And mine. As he lays there, there's a man named Joseph of Arimathea. We looked at him last week, didn't we? And Joseph of Arimathea cannot stand the fact of Jesus hanging on the cross. So Joseph goes to the governor, Pontius Pilate. He makes his faith public. He says, can I have the body of Jesus? Pilate says, take him. I don't want to deal with him anymore. So Joseph goes to the cross. He takes down the cold, dead, brutally unrecognizable, beaten body of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As he holds Jesus in his hands, he does a precious burial, wraps a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe and fine linen cloth around Jesus. And then Joseph takes Jesus to his own tomb, one he bought with his own money, and he lays Jesus in his tomb, a tomb, a tomb meant for him. Jesus filled up the tomb meant for Joseph. He filled up the tomb meant for us. Then a big stone is rolled in front of the door. The Pharisees get a bunch of guards and put them around, put two guards around the rock, around the big stone, so Jesus would not resurrect and that his body wouldn't be taken. They were going to make sure that Jesus was not going to come out of that grave the third day. Jesus is dead now. He lays in that grave dead. But what did we just establish? Who is Jesus? He is what? The way. He is the truth and He is the life. And death cannot hold life. He arose from the grave. 2,000 years ago, early, one Sunday morning, a spring day, much like today, Jesus is physically resurrected from the dead. You, the, the grave, your sin could not hold the way, the truth, and the life. Couldn't do it. So that you would have a way to heaven. <clears throat> Luke 24, 5 through 6. They said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. But he is risen. We are 
And we celebrate this event every year on Easter. We're celebrating that right now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus came out of the grave literally, physically, and bodily. Our sin which took upon Himself, it could not hold Him. Praise God, Christ arose. A little later that Sunday morning, an angel ascends, an angel of the Lord. Rolls back the stone, sits on, uh, sits on top of the stone, and the guards freak out. They fall down as dead men, the Bible says. Then they flee and run in terror. They're scared to death. But let me tell you something. Was rolling that stone away to let Jesus out? No, sir. Jesus Christ was already gone. So now we have Jesus. He's resurrected. He's living. And he makes his first appearance to Mary Magdalene in the garden. Mary's there. Mary's coming to do some more things for burial. She looks in. She realizes the stones roll back and Jesus is not there. She thinks somebody has taken his body. She's not thinking of the resurrection. Then there's a man that comes up behind her and says, Mary, what are you doing? She tells him. And then he says, Mary, she turns around. And she realizes it is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now, we're going to move to where we will spend the rest of this message in an upper room with the disciples. The disciples all gather together in an upper room, the same place they had observed the Passover, that Jesus had washed their feet, the same place Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper just days earlier. But Judas is not there, because why? Judas has killed himself. Judas had worldly sorrow. Judas did not like what he'd done. J Judas killed himself. But Thomas is not there either. Okay, very important. We're, gonna, we're getting here where Jesus appears to Thomas. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. I don't know where Thomas is, but surely he is mourning the death of his Savior, the one he loved so much. And let's, we all, again, we know Thomas is what? Doubting Thomas. Well, let's see what the other apostles did. When they heard about the resurrection. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And when she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, what did they do? Believed not after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went to the country and they went and told it to the residue neither believed they them <laughs> we criticize Thomas so much but they doubted that Jesus was resurrected too why don't we all call them the doubting apostles so Jesus, they're in the upper room and Jesus walks through the locked doors in His glorified body. Oh my goodness, how amazing. Just like in here, and Jesus just walks through the walls. He appears to ten of His disciples. And what does He tell them? After He appeared unto eleven as they said at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen Him after He was risen. Risen. So Jesus comes in and he does the same thing to them as he does to Thomas. He shows them his hands. He shows them his feet. He shows them his side. He says, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. I've conquered death. Your Lord has resurrected. I am the Son of God. He showed them. And then he ate. Oh, I love that introduction of verse 42. He says, do you have any food? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. I, just, I love that interjection there. So now, Thomas... 
And the rest of the sermon, we're looking at Thomas. Thomas was absent. Thomas was not there. I don't know why. Surely it was morning. But they tell Thomas. Here's what they say. Y'all listen up to this, this last encounter, this encounter Thomas had. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas says, I am not going to believe unless you, I, I, I got to see them, but I got to do more than that. I've got to touch them with my finger. I've got to do more than that. I've got to thrust my whole hand into his side, and I promise he, 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 he would have kept going. I need this. I need this. I need this. He had made up in his mind. He had made up in his heart. He was not going to believe, and I ask you this morning, did you come in with that same attitude? That I will not believe. That I have already made up my mind. That I will not make a decision day. It's Easter Sunday. I always come to church on Easter Sunday. But today is not the day I'm going to make a decision. Have you, did you make that up in your heart and your mind before you came here today? What excuses have you given yourself or given to God? But today, amen, is the day to follow the Lord. Thomas hardened his heart from despair and sorrow. He was so sad. He could not imagine. He was so in debt. He was so in dis sorrow about Jesus Christ dying and he didn't go with him. He was so sad. He had hardened his heart. But why have you hardened your heart this morning? He was so he hardened his heart and says, I'm not going to believe. I've got to see him. What has caused you to harden your heart this morning? What did Thomas do? He gave conditions to his belief, didn't he? Looky here. He said, except I shall see. Except I can put my finger. Except I can thrust my hand into the side. He keeps giving these. I'm not going to believe unless this, and unless this, and unless this, and unless this, and unless this. And God, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this. Then maybe I'll think about it. What conditions have you given God all of your life? Accept this God and this and this, then I will believe. But I, no way I'm giving you my life. No way I'm believing in you unless this, this, and this. I got a simple question, and please say amen, those of you believers, those of you that love the Lord. Is the death, burial, and resurrection not enough? It's enough, isn't it? That's all I need. Jesus Christ died for my sins. He was buried in the grave. And three days later, He arose. That's all I need. I don't need an accept. That's enough for me. How many times have you rejected the Lord because of your many conditions? I ask, will you drop those this morning and come to Jesus on faith? Amen? It's by faith you believe. Salvation is by grace through faith. Will you have faith this morning? No more exceptions, no more conditions. But nevertheless, God loves us. We have a God that seeks the lost. We have a God that seeks the unbelieving. Even in their doubt. Even in their exceptions, even in their conditions. God still seeks. Jesus came to seek and to save those which are lost. Amen. And while we are yet sinners... Christ died for us. While we were in our doubt, Christ died for us. While we were sinning and in rejection and saying, no, Christ died for us. While we had conditions, Christ still died for us. And I love these next few verses of this encounter because Jesus could have done this. He could have left Thomas there in his unbelief. He could have left Thomas there doubting. He could have left Thomas there and saying, I'll not believe, but he didn't do it. He sought Thomas and he came to Thomas. And let me tell you, this morning, Jesus does not want you to stay in your unbelief. Amen? He doesn't want you to stay where you are. You've given conditions all your life, but you're here this morning and Jesus Christ is seeking you. He's seeking you. Look at 26 through 29. 
<clears throat> and after eight days, a week later on Sunday, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Oh, I love these three words. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be with you. <laughs> Jesus does it again. He walks through. He's already been to the others. But now he's staying. He comes just for Thomas. Just for one. So Thomas would believe. He walks through the doors. He says, Peace be unto you. He goes straight to Thomas. Now what did Thomas say earlier? Accept this and accept this and accept this. I will not believe. And Jesus walks in and says, Okay, behold the nail prints in my hand. He says, Stick your finger in here and thrust your hand in my side. Will you believe? Be not faithless. But believing, Thomas. Oh well, my goodness, what incredible. Thomas could not imagine somebody rising from the dead. His best friend, his, the person he's dedicated his life to, was dead in the grave. No way he was there. And then all of a sudden before his face stood the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not want Thomas to stay in his state of unbelief. Jesus sought after Thomas and he will seek after you this morning if you'll let him. Amen? He will seek after you this morning if you will let Him. He offered Thomas exactly what he's asking for. Showed him his wounds. He says, look at here. I was hanging from the cross. I had nails driven through my wrists. I had a spear thrust through my side. And I did it for you. And I did it for you. Let me tell you a few things that's already happened. Jesus has already proved His love for us. Amen? Amen? He did that on the cross. Check mark. That's proven. He loves you. Jesus has already proved that He has power. Because He resurrected from the grave. Not only does He love you, but He has power to forgive your sins. And now Jesus is proving Himself even more right now through the Holy Spirit. Jesus desired Thomas believe and he desires from you the same this morning. Look at the last two verses of this encounter. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Being in the presence of the resurrected Christ Thomas cannot help, but he falls to his knees as he holds the Master's hand and he says, My Lord and my God. He knew Jesus was God. He fell to his knees. He didn't unbelieve. He, didn't, he, he, he believed. He saw Jesus Christ. He declared him to be God. So Jesus replies, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas had an encounter with Jesus. Thomas beheld Jesus. Risen from the grave. And Jesus shows him his wounds. But let me tell you something this morning. The holes in his hand and the hole in his side, it was not just for Thomas. It was not just for the apostles but that was for me and that was for you. The nails that held him to the cross was for us. But let me correct that. The nails did not hold him to the cross. You know what did? It was his love for you. 
Today, you, whatever your name is today, it was for you. It was because He loved you and He desires nothing more than you to put your faith and trust in Him. That's what He desires. You individual, is He calling you today? Is He convicting you? Jesus did not want us to stay in our sin, to stay in our unbelief. Jesus wanted a way for us to be reconciled back to God. Jesus does not just want to save you. He wants a personal relationship with you. Amen? Mm. He didn't just die on the cross, though. He didn't just bury what happened. He arose from the dead. And right now as we speak, as I am talking right now, Jesus in the present sits at the right hand of God alive with the wounds in His hand. And He sits right there, right now. He looks down and He desires that you will, like Thomas, confess Him to be Lord and God. Right now, he, that's what His desire is. That none shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. He wants you to believe in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And do you believe that He resurrected from the dead? Do you believe it? And if you truly do, I plead you to repent of your sins right now and put your faith in Jesus Christ that you might be saved. Fall at the feet of Jesus as Thomas did and say, my Lord and my God, fall at the feet of Jesus as you behold the scars and say, save my soul. Ask Him to forgive your sin. They put Him on the cross. To forgive your rebellion and rejection of Him for so long. To forgive your unbelief just like you did Thomas. Finally, give your heart and your life to the Lord. Give it to Jesus. The last thing Jesus said is what? Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed and I, I will tell you this I do not believe that Jesus is going to show up here and come to each one and physically show us his wounds this morning okay here's what I do believe though I believe that we have the Holy Spirit and what's happening is He is showing you His wounds. He is showing you His sacrifice on the cross. He's showing him, you His love for you. He's showing you your salvation plan. He's showing you your sin. And He's showing you the way to be forgiven by God. The Holy Spirit is working on your heart. He's showing you the way. He's showing you the truth. And He is showing you the life. He is showing you that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. That's what's happening right now. He's proven it to you. The Holy Spirit of God who works through the preaching of His Word has encompassed your heart and shown you your sin and your need. Will you allow Him to change your life this morning? He said, you're a sinner. You're not saved. And you cannot, no matter how hard you try, do this on your own. Will you give me your life? Will you fall at His feet? this morning I ask that we very quietly stand as we prepare for an invitation number <clears throat> Thomas had an encounter with Jesus will you have an encounter this morning Christian have you not totally surrendered your life to the Lord? Have you been living a lifestyle of sin? Today's the day to repent, get right with God. Do you need baptism? Do you need church membership? I do not know what you need, but whatever your need is, I ask that you please come. And my last plea before I plead during before I plead more during the song 
is guys, if you came here this morning and are lost and the Holy Spirit has shown you what you need to do, has shown your sin, has shown your unbelief, has shown that you are not saved, will you fall at Jesus' feet and say, my Lord and my God this morning. Father, thank you so much for this service. We ask that during this invitation number, during this time of freedom to respond to your word, to respond to your conviction. Lord, I pray that you do a mighty work. God, I pray that you put distractions aside. God, I pray that you put anything that might hinder the strongholds and the imaginations that uh, exalt themselves against God. But Lord, I pray that you get rid of every one of those. That every thought will be obedient to Christ this morning. God, be with us. During this invitation, it's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.